situation, but we're not any in any position to throw stones on this side of the pond, given our mini Trump that's going to be in place for the next four or five years in any case. Bless him. And here we have um, the one and only Gene Bruce Scott has just joined the waiting room. <laughs> here we go, guys. I could get very political on this, couldn't I, really? You can do whatever you want today. Yeah, you can do whatever you want today, Alex. And here we have. Hi, Alex. Hello, Jean. Thank you for inviting me on this programme, which I have no idea what's happening. So at this moment in time, I'll just, I'll just go along with what everything else is happening. Me either. Paul, what's going on? Welcome. I'm, yeah, Hi, so... Robin. Hi, Jack. <laughs> Hi. Hi. So we're all here. And um, yeah, um, thank you very much for taking up the opportunity to uh, join me on the Cybernaut podcast tonight, Jean. Um, you, you may not be aware, but I'm, I'm quite new to, to podcasting. Um, so this is probably my 10th or 12th um, go at it. Um, and it's mostly thanks to, to Alex um, and also Robin. And Don't th- blame me, Paul. I mean, honestly, <laughs> you know, he just, just throws the blame at me straight away there. Unbelievable. <laughs> well, Alex, if we were Jedi, you would be the master and I would be the mere, the, the Padawan, you know, that's, uh, you know, I am following in your footsteps. I, I get the feeling that you're training me to take over Siren, Siren Radio. Not soon. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Gene. <laughs> From one experience, the enhanced soul to another. Very approached, very, very appreciated. There you go. So, Jean um, and Jackie and, and Robin, it's, it's great to have you here. And obviously, Alex, fantastic to have you here as well. So thank you for coming at last minute. Um, but basically, just tonight was um, an opportunity to um, sort of continue with the conversation that we were having um, on Friday, um, but without any sort of time limit so we can just go and go as long as you want we can we 48 can go. hours yeah you know <laughs> i i do have a lunch appointment so. okay yeah exactly so you know as, as long to save alex and jackie and robin <laughs> from too much of this yeah. well we just can't get enough of gene bruce scott so you know we we need more we needed more <laughs> Okay, so um, Robin, um, to start off with, did you have any questions for Jean? I have an unending supply <laughs> of questions. For I Jean. thought you might. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Come on. Come on there, Robin. What you got? Okay, so last time we spoke, we, we covered the meeting that you had with Donald Belisaro that saw you come on to Magnum which was before you came on to uh, Airwolf. Um, I, I, I believe there was a, a, a link to be between, well, there is kind of a link between Magnum and Airwolf, other than your good self, in that Belisaro was hoping to launch a sister series to Magnum involving the adventures of a helicopter pilot. D- did you know anything about that? No, um, he had such a fascination with helicopters, and I, I do know that that he wanted to have. Um, well, I think he thought that that Airwolf was going to be that, um, and then when the first uh, nine episodes maybe didn't attract a large a, a large enough audience for them uh, that they were saying, yes, it's a, it's a dead on deal. We're going to, you know, sign up for the series for years and years and years. Um, they were, they were trying to figure it out. Yeah, it was, um, it was the, uh, third season episode of Magnum PI entitled Two Birds of a Feather, starring William Lucking, which itself was inspired by several episodes of Belisario's Tales of the Gold Monkey, yeah. Legends Are Forever, and Honor Thy Brother, in which Lucking had played a similar character. The Magnum episode, and I'm reading from Wikipedia here, um, was intended... Not a good source, Robin, not a good <laughs> academic source. Well, it's just as well I'm not an academic. <laughs> uh, the Magnum episode was intended as a backdoor pilot, but the series was not commissioned. Belisario heavily reworked the idea, and the final result was Airwolf. So you could have been right. involved in what could have but didn't become Airwolf even then. Um, yeah, back in, what was that, did you say? Season 83? three. Yeah. 
Yeah, 83, yeah. Um, I don't know if there was any idea that I would be involved in it at that point. Um, that didn't come about until um, Airwolf was on the air. And I, I think that I had enough, um, at the time they used to call it TVQ. Alex, do they still call it TVQ? Mm, yeah. <laughs> It, it's all mixed up now with social media and, and, and all of that, but um, they used to, they, yeah, they used to rate actors and you had a certain score and then it, whatever that score was, let the, the studios and the networks know that they could bank on you to, to, to drive a show, to be on a show. And so, of course, Ernie and Jan had more TVQ than anybody to put together at that particular time and that combination of, of those two actors but they, they were having trouble finding their audience. And so uh, they went you know, back and forth, I guess, w with, with Don to, to figure out what would be next. Um, and they, I, I was on a CBS show, um, I'd been on Magnum. Um, and so I, I think they just figured, well, maybe this is a good mix. She's, uh, she's gonna bring in women, she's gonna bring in younger teenage boys, uh, you know, uh, and make it more family friendly, but in in Dom's turn, even even in in terms of making it more family friendly, I don't think he ever wanted to move away from this idea of this stealth combat machine uh, that was so extraordinary. And of course, uh, Airwolf itself, the the helicopter had already beaten out uh, Blue Thunder, and um, what was the other one? There was there were three. There came was on um, Street Talk, wasn't there, with a motorcycle? Talk, yeah. Well, oh, no, no, no. There's no. There's another helicopter oh. uh, pilot or or series that didn't make it. And so, um, you know, Don, of course, you know, was banking on the lady uh, being the thing that would would uh, would attract all these young people. Um, so anyway, that I think that's how they brought how they brought me on. Um, and then to turn me into a Texas talking highway patrol officer, that was, that was all Dawn. Um, uh, you know, I did the first six ep episodes with barely an accent. And they came back to me and said, we wanna loop some of this because you don't sound Texan enough. And I was like, oh my gosh, I, I don't wanna do a phony Texas accent. This is, I don't, um, oh, I'm really afraid of this. So they brought in um, Robert Easton, I think. He's the, he's kind of the famous dialect coach. Uh, and so they, they brought him in and he came and worked with me at the house uh, for about a week. And then we went into the, the dubbing stage and we looped a lot of lines for the first six episodes. Um, and I wasn't absolutely thrilled with the outcome, but they liked it. And then um, I used the accent for a few more episodes. And then someone upstairs said, let's, let's back off the Texas accent. Let's lose that now. <laughs> She's been in LA long enough. It's like, have you ever met a Texan? <laughs> you know, come on now. They, they never lose their accent. But I was, I was happy enough because it, then I didn't have to think about um, you know, Robert Easton, you know, said, well, now where is she from in Texas? And, you know, it's this particular kind of dialect and this is how this would sound. And it's very different from up north there. You know, they're closer to Oklahoma. It's not like that. It's down. So he was very specific and it was a lot of work um, to figure out how to have the accent consistently. Did, did Robert Easton used to clear his nasal passages in the same way he used to do it when he worked on the Jerry Anderson series? I, he never cleared his nasal passages in front of me. I'm, I'm glad to say. Good to what hear. What was that? It was, uh, I mean, if we're talking about the same Robert Easton, I think we are. He was the voice of Phone Sheridan in Stingray. And Jerry Anderson was very uh, keen to obviously say that uh, what put him off working with him again, because he worked with a lot of the same actors, was before the recording, he'd always uh, spend several minutes actually clearing his nasal passages in a way which kind of put most of the crew off lunch, basically. Just a thought. Maybe he'd get, he got rid of that by the 1980s, obviously. Yeah, yeah. I think someone spoke to him. <laughs> I remember clearly watching the first season of, of Airwolf when it was first broadcast 
in, I think it was 1984 in this country. And there was only a handful of episodes, but they had a certain, and we discussed this before, cinematic quality to them. Yes. Um, and they were, they were action packed. And to me anyway, I think what sold the series more than anything was the fact that it was set in a real world. I mean, in the pilot film, for example, they had to go to Libya and they had to get the helicopter back from, you know, the, the, the summer palace and names were named. It was in, in very much Reagan-esque America. And I, I was delighted that they'd gone for a second season because it seemed too good to not go for a second season, but we'd only had a handful of episodes. Now, when the second season started, that this is where you come in and you were in from the first episode, which we've already discussed, um, called Sweet Bridges Onwards. And I think there, there was a strong possibility that changing the formula and introducing yourself in might have weakened the formula. You know, it might have diluted it a little bit from the, the older pilot and the hotshot young pilot going undercover and defying death and all, all set in the real world. But from that first episode on, it became apparent that this was never, ever going to be a case. And I, I, would, I will go on record and say that you were the strongest female character on TV at that time, bar none, because we'd had stuff like, you know, Charlie's Angels. And what were they really? They, they, they were fashion models. Um, you know, they, they were never in any real danger. It, it wasn't a real world TV series. It was pure fantasy. Now, I know that Airwolf is fantasy as well, but... Being, being that you were such a strong role model and, and continue to be in reruns, did you draw any inspiration from anybody that you know to, to bring that to Caitlin O'Shaughnessy and make her this tough, resilient character? I did. My father. Ah. My father was a career army man, infantry, and um, I was around both him and his uh, fellow uh, army uh, friends, including women officers, who constantly, well, constantly isn't a good word, but who, who discussed the fact that there were certain things that they weren't able to do, they weren't allowed to do, that they felt perfectly capable of doing. And I think at the time, one, one of the things that I think brought in uh, a particular audience in that first nine seasons was we, we had a lot of returning vets, Vietnam vets, and then we still had a lot of young, you know, uh, military guys who came out of World War II in Korea. I mean, they weren't, they, they, they'd gone into the service when they were 17 and 18 years old. So, you know, they, they were very interested in that, the whole Cold War uh, aspect of it, and certainly the, the helicopter, and certainly the combat. But what was missing, I think, for everyone was the approach of women going into combat. And I think that was very much on Don's mind. Um, the, 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 the tower fought it pretty much every step of the way. They, they wanted Caitlin to be more of a damsel in distress. And if you, if you look at how the, the series went, uh, Sweet Bridges was written after um, uh, the first three or four series, uh, shows in the, in this season, they, they, that, that character, uh, at that time hadn't been imagined yet. And so when Dawn won the fight to say, let's, I want to put a woman in a helicopter. I want her to be tough. I wanted to do that, that he wrote that episode. And so I think that the thing that attracted uh, and Jackie, I, I really want you to comment on this because we've talked about it quite a bit. But I have had so much interaction and mail and when I meet people, women in particular, say to me, you gave me the courage to do X. I didn't know I could 
work in a man's world. I didn't know I could go into the military. I didn't know I could fly a helicopter. I didn't know I could become a police officer. So Jackie, we, we have a lot of women who follow the, the fabulous Jean Bruce Scott archive that Jackie has created. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Because I know you've talked with some of the women separately as well about yeah. what drew them to the show. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and and it, it's true. Um, I can speak personally for myself in that um, I've always worked in a male dominated environment, apart from now so much. But when I joined Border Force um, in 2000, I joined a team of men and there was me and one other lady on that team. And it was hard going. Um, and, you know, and to even now, I still channel my inner Caitlin. If, if I've got to face something that is tough or hard going or is going to be a challenge, I still say it to myself even now. Um, but yes, follow it. some of the ladies who follow the page, there's one in particular that springs to mind. She's a nurse in Germany. And um, when obviously COVID broke out, she obviously had to deal with that as, as a member of the medical um, profession. And there's an episode of Airwolf called Condemned where um, Kate and String go to a, well, deal with a virus essentially, which they're looking for the antidote to. Um, and Kate gets into a bit of a panic and she starts to sing Mary Had a Little Lamb. And um, this lady, nurse in Germany, that's how she got through COVID, was doing exactly that. Wow. So even to, even to this day, that character resonates so strongly with so many people. Yeah, I met a, a helicopter pilot who um, had a, 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 a quite a bit of uh, illness as, as a child and um, had difficulty walking. And when she saw Airwolf, all she could think about was, if only I could fly. If, you know, if only I could do that. And she worked through her physical therapy and her all, all, all of that. And um, although she still has a bit of difficulty uh, walking, um, she's not incapacitated in any sense. And she is a helicopter pilot. She owns her own helicopter service up in the Bay Area. And she's now sending out male helicopter pilots <laughs> to do to do jobs and 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 gigs um and i gave her my airwolf crew jacket um when i when i met her um i was so taken by her and by her persistence and and uh and by her story quite frankly and she named her daughter caitlin um after me but um so jen jen's somebody that i i actually very much look up to because um she's she fought a hard battle um, to, to become a pilot and, and that's what she did. So I guess in answer to your, your original question, Robin, um, my, my influences came from my dad. Um, I grew up saying, yes, sir, daddy, sir. Um, we camped a lot and our camp was always policed to wit within an inch of its life. Um, I didn't grow up uh, with guns. My sister was very interested in guns and, and she learned how to shoot very young. Um, so I'm very grateful um, to, uh, to Airwolf and, and to that whole team for teaching me how to handle a gun and shoot a gun. Um, but anyway, yeah, so it was my dad, Major Raymond R. Scott. You, you mentioned, I mean, okay, you, you've learned how to handle guns, but the last time we spoke, you also mentioned that in Sweet Britches, you actually flew the police helicopter. Yes. No, we, we flew, I flew um, Santini Air. Ah. And that was a trick. It was a very clever trick on the, on the part of Don Belisario. Um, so we were way out in Desert Center and we had to get back to the hotel and get off the clock and all of this nonsense. And I was, I was, you know, concerned. I didn't want to cause anybody any trouble. And Davy Jones came up and said, "Hey, Jeannie, you're. I want to. I'm going to take you back uh, to the the hotel uh, in in the helicopter." And I was like, "No, no, no. I'm fine. I yeah. I I I couldn't stand a, on a stool at that point. I was I was so afraid of heights." And he said, "No. Um, I got to take Don. I'm taking Ron Stein, and I'm taking you." So it was like, 
oh God, well, if Dawn and Ron know about this, I, I, I have to go. So I gathered up my stuff. And when I got to the helicopter, Dawn and Ron were sitting in the back. All, you know, they've got their headsets on, they're all ready to go. And Davy says, you know, get in the front, Jeannie. And I'm, I, 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 I don't know if I can do this. He said, get in, get in the front, Jeannie. So I got in, the, I got in the front of the helicopter and here we go taking off. And it was like a roller coaster ride. I mean, I, my stomach was tossing and turning and off we go. And um, we're flying for a while and Davy says, can you, can you see this, whatever he, I, I don't know all the names of everything anymore, but the, the, the gauge that gives you the horizon line and keeps you steady, you know, so that if you, if you turn, move the throttle one way or the other, you, you start to, you, you turn or the cyclic. So anyway, um, he says, I want you to take it. I want you to just now, you know, hold on and, and keep it straight. So of course, as soon as, I took a hold of it. We went <laughs> to the left, and uh, Don and and Ron on the speaker went, "Whoa!" You know, teasing, and because they knew Davy had it, um, and so Davy let me fly for about ten minutes. You know, he was he was on the controls, um, but yeah, I I that's that's my first time ever flying, um, and then after that, both Ernie and I took ground flight. Uh, classes just to learn about flight so that we were safe in the helicopter because there was a lot of concern at the time um, about everyone's safety getting in and out of the different choppers. Um, and so um, when we came back and started filming other close-up things, especially in the police helicopter, that was when Davey would say, Jeannie, remember the, the, the torque, the, the, the feeling that you had uh, when you were in the helicopter, and that's that's what we want to see on camera. So um, it was it was it was exciting. And Jean, was that the was that the only time that that you flew, or did you um, did you fly many more times throughout the season? No, I mean I flew in the helicopter. I didn't fly many more times. It wasn't long after that. Also, that that um, at the time we had to sign in our contracts that, you know, we wouldn't ski, we wouldn't fly in private planes, we wouldn't, there were all kinds of restrictions. Um, and I think that because of some of the, the difficulties that we had on the set, um, they pretty much said to Ernie, both Ernie and myself, um, we, we don't want you to, to learn how to fly. We don't want you in private planes or helicopters and, and all of that. And, and can you describe um, what was it like to wear the the jumpsuit and the and the helmet? <laughs> <laughs> Did the helmet um, mess with your hair and, and makeup and stuff when you were wearing it? <laughs> oh, that's fantastic! My first jumpsuit was one of Jan's old ones that they took in. It was one of those two piecers. I don't know if you guys knew that there was such a thing as a two piece suit and a one piece suit, but the two piecers were awful. They were awful because they bunched up and they came out of the, the belt and they, you know, and, and they, because they weren't very long because the guys also got hot in them. And so it didn't go much past your belly button and they expected them, you know, to stay tucked in and, and, and with the belt and everything. So that was my first, uh, my first experience with the flat suit. The pockets were also too big. I mean, if you go back and look at it, it's like, it's the same thing with my shirt uh, in Sweet Bridges, that, that uh, blue and white cowboy shirt that, that Kate has on. That was a man's shirt that they cut down for me. And I, you know, I kept saying, it's still too big. It looks too big. Well, it's because they didn't cut down the pockets. So here's this girl, you know, I weighed all of 102 pounds in a man's, I don't know, small, extra small, I don't know how, how, how they found it, but they, they trimmed it and cut it down and cut it down, but they didn't redo the pocket. So, um, but same thing with the flight suit. So then um, my, my team kind of said, you know, Jeannie really needs her own flight suit. You know, it, sh it should be, it should be tailor-made and Don, Don agreed. Um, I think they were just, you know, they were saving money at the time. Um, and so then they built the one piece, um, which meant that I had to keep that 102 pounds constantly. 
was so that was that was the only that was the only thing is that it, you know if, if you gained an ounce that suit showed it and and did you did you have pressure to um to stay the same uh, the same weight or the same size well I, nobody ever said anything to me you know in that they they mentioned some other things that i might do to augment my um my anatomy um don't go there I, jean please I don't go there no. No, I said no. So anyway, we didn't do that. Alex is going to keep this very clean, I can tell. Um, so I, I didn't do any of that. Um, uh, but it, in terms of just knowing that I needed to get in that flight suit every week, um, I, I kept a lot of pressure on myself. And um, when, you were, when you were starting out, how quickly did you know that, that this was going to be a hit, that this was something that was different to, to other shows that were out there? Did you have like a sense or a feeling or, or did, did somebody? I, yeah, I, I kind say, of yeah. already knew because I knew the show. I knew of the show before that. Okay. And okay. I had been, you know, I, I was a Don fan, you know, I, I loved Don. Um, and I had followed Tales of the Gold Monkey and, you know, I just, I, I watched his shows. So to, to be told that I was going to go on to this show was a thrill. I mean, I, I could hardly believe it. And I didn't quite know how they were going to bring me in, of course, until I saw that script. But yeah, I was, I was ready. I was excited. Um, Alex, do you have any questions for, for Jean? Oh, there are a million on questions. But Jean, I'm, I'm just fascinated in terms of, obviously talk about Don Balisario, but Magnum PI was very much a Glenn Larson creation. And Glenn Larson had also paved the way for strong female characters, arguably with the likes of Wilma Deering and Buck Rogers, other sort of areas within that. Did you get a sense that Glenn Larson was actively involved with, with, with Magnum and then obviously kind of paved the way for Don to effectively sort of find his own path in many ways? I think, <clears throat> I think he probably paved the way for Don. I don't remember besides uh, a couple of times on the set, uh, on the lot at Universal, um, seeing Glenn. Um, and so, I'm not sure unless he was always back at the bungalow um, um, working with Don. So I, I'm, I, I don't really know what that involvement was. Some uh, historian would have a better clue on that than I do. And Bill Moomy was often famous for saying that when he was a child in the Twilight Zone, everybody loved Rod Serling when he actually came on set and actually chatted with people, etc. When Owen Allen came on set, they were terrified. What was the sense when the showrunner or the producer effectively turned up on set? Was there a sense of anticipation? Was it a case of, great, we can actually talk about issues here? Or was it a case of, we never see them? No, um, with Don, uh, especially that first year, you know, he, if we were on the lot, um, he, was on, he would come down. He would come and check out what was going on or whatever. So um, I don't think it, people were afraid of him. I think they were really excited to have him come down. And then of course, when he directed an episode, we were thrilled because not only was he this fantastic writer, but he was this amazing director. So to be able to, to actually have him at the helm um, made, us, made us all very happy and excited. There were a couple of other fellows who came down who were in the producing team. I don't know, you'll tell me if I shouldn't go here or not, Alex. Um, but uh, you know, they, they did this thing that was common at the time of wearing sunglasses inside or out. So you never saw their eyes. Don never did that. Um, Stephen Miller never did that. Uh, over on Magnum, Charles Johnson never did that. So when these guys came around, it was odd. It was just odd. Um, and so I think, and I think they did that also to be somewhat intimidating because people were nervous about the guys either from the bungalow or from the, from the tower um, coming down to set. Um, in retrospect, um, knowing what I know now, I, I think I would ask them to take off their sunglasses inside. Mm. You know, I'd mm. say, gosh, I, I, I'm loving this conversation, but I'd, I'd really like to see your eyes. <laughs> What's going on over there? Um, because I, I, I just, um, I think, unfortunately, I, I, I wasn't strong enough at the time. I didn't feel strong enough in myself at the time to say, you know, that's, that's kind of weird. So anybody out there listening, um, if you're inside and you have your sunglasses on, 
um, especially uh, talking to somebody that you, you like or, or want to get to know, take the sunglasses off. <laughs> yeah, the eyes are cool. the mirror of the soul, after all. <laughs> yeah. So um, when you were on the set and you were working with the guys, um, were they... Um, what what was that experience like? Were they like were you like the the younger sister? Did they look out for you? Did they look after you when you were there, or or were you one of the lads? Um, so what was the dynamic between you you and the rest of the cast? When I first started out, I was the girl. I think Alex has heard this story before, <laughs> but um, I don't know if it was, was because he couldn't remember my name or he didn't know that I was gonna be on the show for more than five or six episodes. But Ernie affectionately called me the girl and said, hey, bring in the girl. Oh, hey, here comes the girl. And, uh, you know, I was that, that, it was like, again, with the sunglasses, I have a name, (laughs) you know? Either call me by my character name or call me Jean or Jeannie or, you know. But but anyway, so that that was kind of the beginning. And it, it took me a while uh, to get past that. And uh, then they started calling me Jeannie. Um, both, both Jan and Ernie called me Jeannie um, and Alex. Um, and they, I would say the actors and most of the crew fellas, including Ron Stein stunts, um, just treated me as being very capable. Um, I, I was, Although I was thin and, and might have looked frail, I was athletic. I'd been a gymnast, so I, I, you know, I could do things. And so the only times that um, they treated me any different was if, if a, for instance, throwing me into the truck. Um, Jackie and I talked about this the other day. Uh, I, don't, I didn't remember a, a stunt person being on set that night. Um, So I I have to look at it really closely and I'm gonna have to slow down that particular footage. But I do know that that whether or not they used the footage of my being thrown in the truck, I was thrown in the truck. And Freddie Heiss, who was one of the stuntmen, had come up to me and said, Jeannie, we're gonna practice this. Um, I promise you, you're not gonna get hurt. I'm gonna flip you right over. And there is a a mattress in the trunk of of, uh, the truck. and the other fellow is going to help lift you. So you're not going to get hurt, I promise you. And so we did practice that getting me into the truck and I, w- and I was not hurt. The, the scene where um, Buck, uh, the mean cowboy, when he comes into the cell and kind of tackles me, that was not me. That, that was the, my, my stunt double. Um, so they, they treated me like I knew what I was doing. And even with the guns, with the, the fellows who, who brought the guns on set, um, took the guns apart from me, always showed me that, that the, the gun was empty, the barrel was empty, uh, before they handed me the gun, um, told me not to get, uh, uh, there was a shot where Jan had an automatic, uh, and it shot out, even though it was shooting blanks. It, whatever it was sh- shooting out was hot. And if it landed on you, it would burn you. And so they told me, get upstage of Jan. <laughs> don't, <laughs> don't get downstage of Jan when you're running, doing this, all this, this particular scene. Um, so, the, the, you know, they, they looked after me in that sense. Um, the airplane episode, one of the guys came up to me on the set and said, Jeannie, uh, before they turn all that water on, make sure they double check all of the connections on the set and make sure that it's safe uh, for the water. And I was like, well, why wouldn't it be safe? Of course it would be safe. And uh, I said, well, just just double check, you know, well, these are new people in here. We've got a couple of different guys setting things up and you're gonna grab onto this metal railing when you go up those stairs uh, where that water's coming down. So I, I went up to the AD and said, you know, is there any problem with this? You know, is, uh, should I be afraid? of water and electricity. And he was like, no, 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 no. They do this all the time. And I was like, okay. What Alex is shaking his head. You know what Phil Linus had to say about that when we spoke about it a few months ago, Jean. Yes. Don't go there. Yeah. Oh, don't go there. Don't tell that story. 
no, 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 you can tell the story by all means. I'm just saying it's oh. what he said on the set. Be be very careful. Yeah, yeah. So so I I I was I was concerned. Um and I said, Well, do you think you could run it? Could you walk it through one time for me? Um, before we do it when the water's running. And uh I think that it was Warren Gray. He was a, a wonderful AD. <laughs> His eyebrows just went up and he said, we're going to check all that before we, before we do that shot and I'll run it for you. So then they called a 10 and of course they all went in and checked it. Everything was fine, but again, it was, it was warrant, you know, it was the AD being put on the spot and having to grab that, that railing uh, that, that made them actually double check it. Yeah. But, but... Now, I mean, you know, you just, you're, if you, I, I would say to anybody who's doing, uh, any kind of show like this, any action adventure show or, you know, God, oh my gosh, I am just so in awe of all these wonderful women uh, in the in the current uh, 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 Mar uh, Marvel comics. Uh, yeah, the MCU. Coming to life. I, I'm just, you know, they're incredible. But I would just say, always double check. I'll, you know, never, never be nervous about something. Um, so that, that leads quite nicely onto um, the next question I was thinking of, um, which is um, actresses or actors like um, Brie Larson, who uh, famously played Captain Marvel um, in, in the recent film, was hailed as the, the first sort of female hero or superhero to be on film. Um, but from, from my, um, you know, my limited uh, sort of you know knowledge of film i would say that 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 title has to go to um sigourney weaver like from alien and aliens because she was you know a very strong um very developed female character um in that franchise um do you because as um as caitlin um in those, in, you know, in the eighties, um, you have that reputation. You've inspired many people, like Jackie and and the the nurse that that Jackie told us about, um, and you know, possibly millions of women around the world um, from as far back as when you started on Airwolf. Do you feel that like Hollywood uh, has got a short memory, or that they're kind <laughs> of <laughs> that they're selling you short? Who's you know? Catherine Hepburn then? Who was she? <laughs> Catherine Hepburn, anybody? Yeah. yeah. That woman was on uh, the African Queen in in the dead of the jungle, fighting leeches and and snakes and spiders and yeah. And Humphrey Bogart. Well, and and fighting off Humphrey Bogart. No, he no. Lauren was there. She he was not interested in Catherine. Um, but but yes, yeah, I would say uh, yeah, it's a very short memory, and and it's all about um, you know for all it, it's about the hype. Yeah, do you it's, think it's it's, it's, a, it's marketing more than anything? It's marketing. It's marketing, yeah. and and you know, for uh, for young people, it is the first time they've ever seen it. Yeah. You know, so who, our memories are short as well. You know, we 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 we. Well, you remembered Catherine Hepburn, and so do I. So what that's that's telling a lot about us. Now. Evanescence, the fading of memories over time. Basically, we can go back to uh, the, uh, the the founding of, of Charlie Chaplin and the whole sort of United Artists Studio. The, the first woman who took the pie in the face. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh no! Wasn't it Mary Pickford who was actually on the ice flow? going up to the falls she what mary pickford what well, indeed so yeah yes yeah i you know i i think that there's also a tendency especially for uh action heroes to to think that that they're the first who ever did it um i'm i'm i try to be careful about talking about caitlin and being the first to go into combat that was what they were were telling me at the time and why they they weren't letting me um you know, fly missions and, and, and do what I want, what I wanted to do, what Jeannie wanted to do. Um, so I, I, I would, again, I would have to, I want to get with a historian who can say, no, no, Jeannie, Catherine Hepburn was first, <laughs> you know. And, and actually, Jamie Summers, even though she was bionic, also did it in the 1970s as well, flew aircraft and such like. Jamie, Jamie Summers, but then also, you know, we had Wonder Woman. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
So I think that, that we're, it's an evolutionary kind of thing. I, what I'm so thrilled about now is that there is a Captain Marvel that yeah. is a female. I, I was going to add that um, I don't mean any disrespect to Brie Larson or, or the work that she did or, or the character. It was, um, I, I made that comparison merely because... She would shoot you down, Paul. <laughs> Brie doesn't take any prisoners at all. So yeah. it would <laughs> I was I was going to say, um, it's because of the, the parallels between the two characters. So um, the Captain Marvel character is also um, a female pilot, but in this, in this uh, case, it's airplanes um, or fighter jets. And there was um, the the sort of angle that um, she's the first um, female of that generation to, to become a pilot and to, you know, earn her wings. And it was just comparable, um, you know, between the two characters. That's why I made that. that um, in real life, of it. course, Paul, don't forget Valentina Tereshkova, the first uh, woman in space, courtesy of the USSR. But maybe you won't want to speak about that on a Glenn Larson, Don, Don Berisario series. <laughs> what year was that, Alex? 61. 61. Boy, the Russians were way ahead of us, weren't they? Um, yeah, I mean, I just, I just think that there was, a, I don't know how it is uh, in Great Britain, but in the United States, there was a huge public outcry about women flying or being in combat and, and, and all of that. And it, it, it really went on much too long. So um, I, I, I do think that, in, in, especially in the Marvel world, um, that that's gonna be a big story. It's gonna continue to be a big story. Yeah, brilliant. Thank uh, if, you. I, so, if I may just um, take us back to one of your earlier answers, um, there's a well-known story about Gene Roddenberry, creator of Star Trek, that when he first cast the pilot to Star Trek um, called The Cage, he had a female first officer and she had to be dropped because the uh, net network executives could not even imagine there being a woman capable of being second in command of the USS Enterprise. Well, to to now, be fair, okay, Robin, the amazing. official line was he could actually they could actually choose between dropping number one as female or getting rid of the guy with the ears. So it was a choice. Yeah. But she was in the line of fire, obviously. So my, my, my disappointment, I think, comes from the fact that they didn't believe that anybody could be, a female could be second in command of the Enterprise. And that was 1964. Now, we go forward, say, 20 years. And when Don Belisario had the vision to bring a female on board Airwolf, the guys in the Black Tower, the executives, didn't want her involved in the action. She should be the damsel in distress or maybe the love interest of the week. Uh, that's appalling. Then you mentioned that, you know, we all know that Hollywood have such a short memory. Do you think that might still be the case today or have they finally learned? Boy, that's a really good question. Um, boy, I... I'm hopeful that that they've learned, um, and I think that we do have some evidence of it. Um, so uh, um, I'm going to say, you know, the the, the fellows, because uh, I, now I'm 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 feeling anxious about dissing the fellows in the tower. Some of the fellows in the tower are actually fans and friends of mine who had brought me back time and again on series, on shows, on you know all of that, and so. Um, but I, I think that this particular character, as you're saying, Robin, this, for some reason, there was, there was a, a block and they were, uh, at that time, the, the fellows that were in, in big power at Universal were older gentlemen. Um, and so I think they were also, uh, schooling Glenn or, or Don or whoever, and, and basically saying, no, I, I know how this goes and women don't fly helicopters and women don't go into combat and this is going to bring us a lot of trouble down the road. Although, interesting enough, you can see a direct link between, certainly in terms of uh, Don Barasario's productions from uh, Airwolf through Quantum Leap, through JAG, through NCIS, there's been a definite progression. 
and you look at all of the NCIS series, the never ending NCIS series, the NCIS Los Angeles, NCIS uh, New Orleans and, and the, the, the original NCIS. And they've had strong female characters woven into that. So I think it's taking time. It's been a long evolutionary thing, but there are definite signs that actually there is a change. I, I think that actually probably the 1980s was the last time you could actually get away with that kind of thought. And remember, of course, we're talking 10 years before the height of a certain Mr. Weinstein working in his own sort of abominable way in terms of show business and, and various other aspects as well. I mean, that, that broadens things course. out. Also, we've had people like, now, was it Sherry Lansing, who was head of Paramount for a while? We've got Kathleen Kennedy in charge of Lucasfilm. So perhaps that glass ceiling may have had uh, Caitlin O'Shaughnessy's dainty little combat boot kicking it in somewhat. And maybe the age of Hollywood misogynism may well be over. Yeah, I, 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 I'm hoping so, Robin. Um, I think that some of it still exists. I, I do have a few, <laughs> so I do have a few friends who are, are a bit younger than me who are still in the biz, um, both producers and network guys. And I'm, I'm often surprised that they're, I, I don't know why, why, why isn't there a female, uh, Mark Harmon running NCIS? And, and why don't, you know, why, why doesn't that character's backstory go back to 1961? and, and, and uh, the Russian uh, pilot. You know, I, I think it could be quite interesting. And so again, with uh, uh, Brie Larson, you know, I think that that's great that that character has the backstory that she does and that she's actually, you know, as you say, using her dainty boot <laughs> to kick down that door. Um, yeah, so... Um... Jackie, have you got any questions for Jean? Obviously, I know that you 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 know you you speak together uh, quite yes. a bit. We got we gossip about all sorts. <laughs> um, <laughs> but one thing I've never actually asked Jean, it's something that occurred to me was, um, do you have a favourite memory from Airwolf? Something that you did that you you know sticks with you, stands out more than any of the other things? Well, I think that the two episodes that stick out the most for me are Sweet Bridges and Condemned. And uh, rewatching Sweet Bridges, I was I was telling Jackie just the other day. Uh, Jan and I cl just clicked, and and uh, he was uh, so absolutely present and wonderful uh, for that whole episode. It was just it was delightful shooting, and condemned he was he was too, um, and it and it was just the two of us. Um, that one, and then the one, the one where I saved Jan. Oh, now I'm, it's, it's, Horn of Plenty. Uh, the one where, where I saved Jan. Um, yeah, Horn, Horn of Plenty. Plenty. Horn of Plenty. Um, you know, there were just these, these wonderful moments that happened. And, and I've got to tell you on, on uh, Horn of Plenty, Sutton was pushing us so hard. Um, and we were just, you know, it, we were so locked into, the life and death situation and particularly in that scene um and we did it a lot a, a number of times um those those are the things that i remember those those moments of like struggling to find the thing that you need to find on set and then finding it and having that moment and that connection on set were, were, were probably my favorite does that answer your question yeah Okay, I, I'll try to think if I can pick one. Alex has asked me this before as well, and huh. yeah, can I, I just can I ask you about uh, what what is certainly one of my favourites and one of one of, I think the strongest episodes that you guys ever did in season three, called "And a Child Shall Lead," which concerned a a young man with learning difficulties, right. and he he appears you know, sort of to be uh, somewhat handicapped, but he has actually a photographic memory and he has memorized the plans that is, the blueprints that his father did for, for a weapon. I, I can't remember if it was actually Airwolf itself. I don't remember. No, it was air, air, some sort of um, wings for aircraft or something. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was something like that. I, I need to go back and revisit that one. Um but it was a marvellous job of acting. And it was, 
I think the first time I saw somebody not pretend, somebody who actually had difficulties cast mm -hmm. in the role of somebody who had difficulties, if, if that's not too politically incorrect. If it is, I apologize unreservedly. Um, no, it wasn't, uh, I don't think it was the first time, um, but um, you're absolutely right. At, at, at the time, um, it wasn't as widely, um, that the, the, I mean, the, the series Highway to Heaven, I think, was, was another what? great film. Highway to Heaven with Michael Landon was very keen on actually having a, a diverse and inclusive cast. And I think that that range of inclusivity is also something which is very much associated with Belisario and, and the productions within that. So they, they do actually sort of incorporate, as I say, a genuine and inclusive cast. Yes, yeah, I think so as well. I think that, uh, you know, the, the, the young man that played that part was was incredibly sweet and gentle. And that was actually a very difficult episode to shoot for, for a number of reasons. And um, I, I again, I think Don, wanted to be in the vanguard and wanted to be embracing that. He did it with Trax. Um, you know, Trax was a, a wonderful memory and a wonderful episode. That was the other one I was going to mention. <laughs> yes, yes. And Alan Toy, who was one of the characters. Jackie, do you remember which character you played? Alan Toy? Not off the top of my head, no. <laughs> um, so Alan, Alan actually uh, had started an organization in, in Hollywood. Uh, at, at the time, uh, it was for called uh, actors with disabilities. It's not called that any longer. Um, but it, it, there was a there was a an, a groundswell of actors that said, "Hey, listen, I I am in a wheelchair. I do have this. I do you know cast me. I'm still an actor. I'm an actor." Um, and so Don did. I mean, he cast like five actors who were all uh, in, uh, uh, in wheelchairs or walked with disabilities so that they... they uh... And that's the one where Hawk himself gets injured and they all need to band together, of course, while you and uh, Santini launch... Well, you're, you're desperately searching for him. Yes, yeah. That was, that was another standout episode. Yeah. And I think it brought home that these episodes were very much set in in the real world right right and that a helicopter like airwolf uh doesn't always have to be used for combat you know i think that's also part of uh the evolution of how we start to think about um our our different communities you know here living here in san diego on the coast um probably well now unfortunately weekly um the coast guard is uh, uh, discovering and bringing in people who have been trying to c come to America by boat who don't swim. Their they're, they're, they're boat capsizes and, and they've got, you know, three minutes to get to them or, or something. Um, they could not do that with a the boat. They have to have a high speed helicopter. They have to have a helicopter that's very ma maneuverable and can get down close and get someone into that water to get these people out. Um, but that wasn't the case. I, again, I, I think that helicopters were thought about only or primarily for combat. You know? Yeah, the, the third act where everything gets blown up. Now, speaking of that, in Sweet Britches, um, as we come to the end of the episode, um, you know, Airwolf sweeps in to um, Sylvester LeVay's magnificent score and destroys most of the small town. Was that a standing set? I mean, it, it looked realistic. It didn't look temporary at all to me. No, 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 no. That was a real town. And in fact, there, there were two gas stations that were still open there. It's, it's called Desert Center. And it truly is in the center of the desert, you know? So it was like the last stop before, you know, you get gas for another, you know, 200 miles or something. Um, I, so I, I yeah. don't mind you guys coming in and blowing the entire place up. Actually, you know, they, the, the town itself was, was dying. Um, the, the, I think what was sheriff's, the sheriff's office had been a Texaco station or something. 
Um, so they, of course, camouflaged all that and turned it into the sheriff's station. Um, and the town itself, uh, the main highway had bypassed it. Um, and so the, the new real town had everything that the little town uh, had to offer at one time. And they were, I think, probably thrilled to get however many thousands of dollars they got to blow everything up. They did a it was thing. very hot. It one of the crew members said that those scenes that we shot in the in the cell and in in uh, is it Brogan Sheriff Brogan's yeah, yeah. yeah office um, that by the time they had all the lights and everything in there it was over 130 wow. degrees and you, we are just sweating bullets. Um, I know that they had changes of clothes for both of us. Um, uh, uh, yeah, it was very, it was very uncomfortable. They constantly bring us a water. The, the fellow who played Bobby, I was telling Kate, it was such a delightful young actor. Oh my gosh. And he, every time he looked at me, he handed me a glass of water. <laughs> you know, it's like, Jeannie, drink this. You're going to pass out. Drink this. You know, he was, he was just so kind. And so then of course, when he, you know, help, helps get me um, from outside the cell and, and over to my own chopper, you know, he said before we even practiced the run, he said, now you need to be very careful out here because it's, it's uneven and there's broken cement and there's broken glass. And, you know, so I'm going to hold on to you real tight and I won't let you fall, you know, and we're just going to run as fast as we can, but it's really uneven out here. <laughs> he was just, he was the sweetest guy. I loved him. That's amazing. So, um, Another question that I've got is um, one more question, and then I have to go, or I'm going to miss my my appointment. That that's that's fine. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, was there ever any role that you really really wanted, and you went for it but didn't get it? There was, and I'm so glad now that I didn't get it. <laughs> um, I really wanted to play Becky Thatcher on Huck and Finn. And this was a series that was on NBC um, and it was going to be starring uh, uh, Peter Horton. Oh, there they are. Um, <laughs> it was going to be starring Peter Horton and Michael Dudikoff, who had been the first Captain America or well, well may, Alex, was he the first? <laughs> he was my generation's the first. Mm. Um, and we had been in acting class together at Vincent Chase's on camera workshop. And Duty and I were just great friends. And so we both got screen tests for this particular show. Um, and so uh, I, I went in and I was, you know, all excited and we were doing the screen test. And I, I, I went into the restroom. And when I came out of the restroom, um, there was a casting director there. And she said, Jeannie, we, we've been looking all over for you. You know, I, I, I didn't, I, I, I've completely, my mind is a, is a blank, but we're casting this new role in General Hospital. Um, the character's name is Laura and you're perfect for it. I'm screwing this up. <laughs> I can't tell a joke and I can't tell my own stories. I had, uh, we're looking for you, we're casting Jessica and you were so right for Laura, which I didn't get on General Hospital. I, can I bring you in for Jessica on Days of Our Lives? And I said, oh, uh, no, I, you know, I'm testing for Huck and, Huck and Finn. And, you know, I feel really good about it. And I don't want to jinx it. And she said, okay, well, you you, you do this. And then we'll, we'll set up in a meeting and, we'll, and we'll, we'll go from there. I went in and I did my screen test. And I thought I did a great job. And uh, I then two days later, I went in and I did uh, a, a test for Jessica. And nobody's telling me about anything. You know, they haven't made a decision on Huck and Finn. And they hadn't made a decision on, on, on Days of Our Lives. Anyway, I didn't get Huck and Finn, but I did get Jessica. And so that, that was told to me by the reason that I got it was Fred Silverman, who was the head of the network at the time. And Fred told me, we couldn't make a decision. We were looking at you, my wife and I were looking at the tapes and watching you and Huck and Finn and watching you in the day's test. And it came down to, we just weren't certain Huck and Finn was gonna go. 
and we wanted you on the network. We wanted you on the show. And so he cast me in Days of Our Lives. And that ended up being two and a half years or so. And that also led, of course, to Magnum and, and everything else. So yes, there was a part that I wanted so desperately. And even after getting Days, it was like, I talked to Michael and say, I, I just wish, because I, I think they shot maybe, probably nine episodes, because that's what they did at the time, uh, you know, to, to see if it was gonna, if a show was gonna go. But they, you know, they got to do all kinds of, they were going out into the West and they were riding horses and they were shooting guns. And I just thought, oh, I want to do that show. <laughs> but you, you got to, to go to Hawaii. <laughs> but I did. I got yeah. to go to Hawaii. I did. I did. So you got to do that instead of being a cowgirl. That's right. That's right. <laughs> I got to be an officer and a gentlewoman. <laughs> that's brilliant thank you so much for for everything gene and thank you jackie thank you and thank you alex and thank you robin um, thank you so yeah i think we'll we'll call it a, a wrap then um unless is it over can... we've got another 47 <laughs> hours to go i thought <laughs> yeah. well we can keep going but gene's got a lunch date so yes alex <laughs> am i still talking to you on friday or, or... that would be wonderful gene we will okay. speak to you all then right. that'd be fantastic all right. cheers okay. all right bon appetit gene thank really? you all so much you're helping my memory no worries. Um, before you go, um, where can the fans get hold of you? Oh, the the best and only place to get hold of me is through... Not physically, of course. Not physically, of course. <laughs> That's Randy Reinhold, so hold, hold it there. Yeah, Randy Randy's going to come in and, you know, have to beat up everybody. Uh, the Gene Bruce Scott Archive on Facebook. That is actually, Jackie Renwick is curating it, and that is actually with me. So we speak every single week. Um, we email every day. We <laughs> WhatsApp and chat constantly throughout the day. Um, so that, that's how to get a hold of me. Um, uh, yeah, that's the best and only way. Please, please, please. Brilliant. Um, and I was going to yeah. say, Alex, we're, we're starting the campaign to get Gene into the new Magnum PI, right? That's what part of this is. Yeah. That is a done deal. I mean, if, yeah. if they've got any sense whatsoever in those ivory towers in the land of Hollywood, then they should book Gene Bruce Scott immediately to actually make not just a one episode, but a full series return to Magnum P.I. with Jay Hernandez. Oh, my gosh. I would love that. Yeah. I would I, love that. I think they're missing Either a trick if they don't do that. Or, so, so Magnum P.I. would be great, but I would also love to go to New York and sweep uh, Tom's character on Blue Bloods off his feet oh, as a woman yes. of his own age yeah. <laughs> and become a mother to those motherless children. <laughs> <laughs> brilliant so <laughs> on that um thank you so much gene and jackie and alex and robin um thank you with everything that i am and hopefully we'll see you again soon thank you paul thank wonderful everything robin, are, paul. Jackie, alex thank you so much thank you thank you thank you great talking to you all again love you guys bye everybody bye bye, bye.